Do we only use about 10% of our brains? So a common idea, uh, and a, a really enticing one as well, this idea that we have the vast majority of our mental capacity locked away somewhere, just waiting for us to work out how to tap into it. Unfortunately, it's not true. In fact, there have been a number of studies and experiments designed specifically to prove or disprove this idea, and it's been largely debunked now, which is a shame. But are there ways that we can make more effective use of the brains that we do have for specific tasks, for specific things? And the answer to that one is hell yes. And it's something I've been really interested in for quite a number of years now. In fact, the, the first conference talk I ever did on a stage much like this nearly 20 years ago was about just that topic. It was called organic programming, and it was just basically a collection of, of mind hacks, productivity hacks, things borrowed from psychology and NLP, just in a big sort of grab bag of productivity techniques. And I'm still interested in that. Um, interestingly, in the meantime, uh, some of those ideas have moved from <clears throat> a little bit more niche to maybe a bit more mainstream. So I haven't felt the need to talk about them so much in recent years. But in that same period of time, I've also been really interested in something else, and that's test-driven development, or TDD. In fact, that was one of the main reasons that I originally wrote the, the test framework Catch, now Catch 2, was to do better TDD. And for some years now, I've been doing uh, TDD training as well, and in the last couple of years, it's occurred to me more and more that when you bring these two things together, you actually get something that's a bit more than the sum of their parts. That it's not just that you can be more productive at using TDD, but you can be much more productive. They sort of multiply together. And I've been really thinking about why that is. And I think I finally got to the point that I can present that as a talk. And that is this talk. It's the psychological underpinnings of how to get the best out of TDD. And perhaps also, you can think of it as the TDD underpinnings of how to get the best out of psychology. Well, we'll see about that one. So I'm really interested in, in giving this talk and seeing what people's reaction is, whether it's just me. Before we get stuck into that, I should probably introduce myself. So I'm Phil Nash. I'm a developer advocate at Sonar. You can see our logo up there. Uh, we do static analysis tools. In fact, our, our tagline is that we help you to clean code, not just to write clean code, but to clean code. So it's, it's all about um, yeah, clean code, code quality. Fits right into what we're talking about, but we're not really going to be talking from a static analysis perspective today. So I won't say any more about it now. Do feel free to come up and talk to me about it uh, after or later in the week uh, if you want to find out more about that. You can reach me on X formerly Twitter or Mastodon at these addresses, and I will show this slide again at the end uh, if you want to, to follow me there. The other thing that will be on the final slide will be a link to a single page that has all of the references for further reading, further watching, because we're going to touch on a lot of deep subjects we're only going to scratch the surface of. If you want to do more background reading, then watch out for that link, and that will get you started on where to follow up. So let's get started on our material. And I want to get right back to the fundamentals of testing and, and ask some questions. So why do we write tests? And in fact, I want to go back even further than that. I like starting with the why, but let's go even before that and say, do we write tests at all? Not everyone writes tests at all. I'm not going to ask that question of the room, but I do have some questions I do want to ask. Who here regularly writes tests for their code um, in their you know, regular development cycle. Not necessarily all of, the, all of the code, and not necessarily before the tests, sorry, before the code, but it's just a regular part of your development habit. Who, who here does that? So it's probably about two-thirds of the room, I'd say, at a glance. All right, who's currently working on a code base that has at least 90% code coverage, if you can measure that, or at least finger in the air? Much fewer. Okay. What about this one, then? So who thinks they should probably write more tests? I think, I think that's most people, certainly more than the first group. Most of us think we should be writing more tests. So why do we not? In fact, let's bring that wire back in, but, but pose that question. <clears throat> why do we not write tests? Or, just to include everyone, why do we not write enough tests? 
If you think we should be writing more, but we're not, what's stopping us? Is it too hard? Do we not know how to do it? Is there something else getting in the way? Do we not see the value in it? All sorts of questions we could ask. I think it's valuable to ask those questions and not just put it aside. So I'm going to put up some possible reasons. Some of these may resonate with you. I think these are probably the most common ones. Plenty more that may apply to you. It's not exhaustive. So maybe you think the writing test is extra work. I mean, you've written the code. You've seen that it works somehow. We'll put aside whether you consider that a test. But talking about automated tests that you then write, that's no extra work. Because you know it works. Why should I do extra work? Related to that, it must slow you down. You've got to do this extra work. And by some estimations, you should be writing at least as much test code as production code. You may have heard that. It may be surprising to some people. So if you're going to write double the amount of code, that's got to take longer. It's got to slow you down. I don't have time for that. Or maybe it just distracts from what you're doing. I've got this interesting problem I'm going to solve. I don't want to be distracted by having to write tests for it. That takes a different mindset. don't want to be distracted. Or maybe they're just boring. Yeah, I, I, I'm not interested in writing tests. That's not what motivates me. OK. Well, I'm not making any judgments just yet about whether these are valid or not. We will come back to them. You can probably guess where I'll... I'll land on them, but let's go back to our question. Why do we write tests? And now, well, we, we said we're going to talk about the psychology of TDD, and this is really the philosophy of TDD. Why do we write tests? I'm going to put a few, a few suggestions up, perhaps start with the most obvious one. Well, of course, we write tests to catch bugs, whether we catch them before we've written them or not is another question. But yeah, catching bugs is a big part of it. It's important. It's not the only thing, though. So what else? How about this one? To encode our expectations. Maybe you don't think about this so much, but when you're writing a test, especially if you're writing it before the code, really you're thinking, well, what do I expect this code to do? You have to think about that first. Once you know what it is, then you can write it down. Encode as a test. You've encoded your expectation. And now you don't have to worry about that anymore because the test is there telling you whether or not you've met that expectation. You can think about other things. This turns out to be quite pivotal, and we're going to come back to this later. But maybe it's not one you thought of. So maybe a more obvious one again, to catch regressions. Sometimes we find a bug in production or manual testing, and we think, oh, I don't have a test for that. So you write a test first that reproduces the issue, you fix the bug, and you leave the test in, because now it's a regression test, to make sure that bug never comes back again. But we even call them regression tests if there was never a bug there to start with. Just having a large body of tests that we can run against all the code after any change you make, we can tell if we've broken anything that we'd written before. That's a different form of regression. So regression testing is, is really important as well. What about this one? Writing tests as documentation. For some people, this seems obvious. And for others, you think, what's it got to do with documentation? But your tests are showing how to use your code, where the boundaries are, how to use it properly. Of course, the flip side is, sometimes you write tests that are probing at these edge cases. You don't actually want people to be using, but you just want to make sure that they're well tested. So you do need to clearly mark which is which. So that, that is one caveat. But the advantage of this is, it solves one of the biggest problems of developer documentation is that it's always getting out of sync and nobody wants to maintain it. But your tests are tested against the code. So if they get out of sync, the tests will break. So they're automatically kept in sync. So it's a really valuable form of testing and you should lean into that if you, if you can. So these are a few reasons, just to give you a taster. Now, so I do TDD training uh, fairly often. And uh, every time I do it, I have a, a flip chart session where I ask this question, why do we write tests, and get all the, all the suggestions from people. And there's always one or two surprises, and I'm building my list up over time. So I'm not going to show you all of them, but here's a, here's a few more. I'm not going to go through one by one. But quite a few additional benefits we get from testing. Now, I don't know if you noticed the... Um, uh, that's not going to work. There we go. <laughs> On the right-hand side there, slightly different shade. 
Everything on the right-hand side, those benefits we only really get if we're doing TDD. The ones on the left we get from just general testing. So it's another reason that it's worth looking at TDD, not just testing. As I say, there's many more, dozens more that I've got in a, in a list somewhere. So is it just an exercise of weighing up these benefits against these downsides? You know, how, how can you even measure that? No wonder we find ourselves thinking, ah, it's not really worth writing this test if we're having to do that mental calculus. But what if I was to say to you that instead of tests being extra work, they would help you to avoid rework such that in the long run, you've actually done less work overall. And instead of slowing you down, they can actually speed you up. And instead of distracting you from what you're doing, they can keep you focused on what matters the most. And if instead of being boring, they're actually fun. All right, a lot of claims I'm gonna to need to back up. And we're gonna come back to this at the end to see how we got on. These are my claims. Right, big question, of course, is how are we gonna do that? How are we gonna achieve, meet those claims? Now we're gonna get into the psychology of TDD. And before we really get stuck into this, I wanna just emphasize one uh, fundamental principle of all of this. It's gonna underpin everything. And it's really more sort of neuroscience than, than psychology itself. And I think it's so important, it deserves a little video to run in the background while I tell you about it. So we're probably familiar with the fact that our brains are basically just big association machines. It's a network of connections. And, and everything is based on links between neurons and, and pathways between neurons. And it's those connections that make everything work. It sort of underpins everything else. Not just our memories, that we might be used to thinking of this way, but our behaviors our mindsets, what mental resources we can bring to a problem, our emotions, our moods, they're all un underneath. They're just pathways through our neural network in our brains. If we keep this in mind, a lot of the other things we're going to talk about are going to make a lot more sense. So let's get into that a little bit, because I want to talk about three uh, areas that are in this sort of um, area between psychology and, and neuroscience. One is habit forming. Because to really take advantage of something like TDD, you need to get into the habit of doing it. And often that's the first stumbling block. You might have bought into all of the benefits, but you just can't seem to do it day to day. We can look at that. The second I'm calling dopamine triggers. And this sort of plays into the habit forming, but it's also a big subject in its own right. There are parts of the TDD cycle that really play nicely into this. And we'll talk about that separately. And then we're going to talk about externalizing your brain. This is what's going to help us to focus on things while not losing sight of the big picture. So before we get into those three areas, I want to take a little detour for a bit of a, a technical part of this. I talk about a tale of two cycles. Now, this is partly an excuse to put up a photo of my sons. Although this is uh, nearly 10 years ago now. They're, they're a little bit bigger, and so are their bikes. But yes, they are twins. But there's two cycles that I want to talk about. And the first one is the TDD cycle. So if you've looked at TDD before, or even if you haven't, you've probably seen something like this, sometimes called the red-green refactor cycle uh, because of the, the three main areas up there. Um, the three main components, they're usually colored, certainly red and green, and then not always the amber or orange for refactoring, uh, but I like to do it that way to complete the, the traffic light metaphor. And, and apologies if you do have trouble distinguishing colors, it's not really necessary to understand this, it's just an extra metaphor. But that's where the, the red-green refactor comes from. I put an extra step in there, the are we done step, and we'll, we'll see why that's important to separate out a bit later. But let's just have a little tour around the TDD cycle just to get familiar with it, because not everyone's necessarily on the same page with this. So we start by writing a failing test. So that green box at the top. And I've emphasized the word start. We've got a separate 
point in from there because we have to start here, otherwise we're not doing TDD. If we don't start by writing a test, it's not TDD. And if that test is not failing, it's not TDD. That doesn't mean that if you write a test that passes, it's not useful. But it has to be intentional. So there are many cases where you write a test, you expect it to pass, and it does, and that's great. That's not part of the TDD cycle, but it's still valuable. It's worth recognizing the difference. So you have to see that failing test. Now we'll talk a little bit about why a bit later. The test itself doesn't necessarily have to be a, an assertion in a test framework. It could be a compiler error. It could be other things. It just needs to be some way that you can see whether the expectation is met automatically. Now, once we've got that failing test, only then do we move on to writing the code that will make that test pass, the green step. Now, I've written here, write just the code to make the test pass. It's an important distinction in two ways. First of all, we, wanna, we want the simplest possible sort of values, and we we'll, we'll, we'll start with things like empty strings, zeros, null pointers, empty optionals. Start with those things and then build up to more complex things because it will help you to make sure that as you generalize your code under test, it will sort of generalize progressively from simpler to more complex. That's quite important. We'll maybe touch on that in a bit. The other way that we want to write only just the code to make the test pass is we're not concerned here with clean code, well-factored code all the design principles that we know we want to include in our, our code base, but we're not doing it right here. We're just doing the, the easiest thing that's going to work, the simplest thing that's going to work, because we have a separate step, the refactor step, which is where we do all the cleanup. But the nice thing about separating these, these two, well, there's a few nice things, but one of them is during the green stage, we're not generally touching other parts of the code base. We're less likely to break anything else. We might do that in the refactor step, because to refactor, we may change other parts of the code base. The other big advantage we'll talk about a little bit later. So refactoring is when you have to bring your design principles, which means you have to know what the design principles are. That's beyond the scope of this particular talk. You might want to speak to uh, Klaus down here at the front about some of those, <laughs> just, just to set him up. Once you've done your refactoring, you can move on to say, actually, are we done? Do we have any other tests that we need to write? If you can't think of another failing test to write that's important, then you're done. And sometimes that might be surprising. Let's have a, a little demo to see how this actually works in real code. Now, because it's not the main part of my talk, um, and it does take a bit of time, I do more of a reconstructed demo in slides, but I try to give it a bit of a live feel, so we'll see how it goes. So the demo I want to give is a little programming exercise that I call LeftPad. So you may remember the JavaScript library of the same name that became famous a few years ago because the author pulled it from NPM and then half the internet stopped working. Because it turned out they all transitively depended on it. And one of the, the things we talked about at the time was, why does half the internet depend on such a small, simple library that you could easily write yourself? Well, let's see how easy it is to write ourselves and do it in C++. So, will we use catch, of course? Why not? Now, if you've used catch before, you know all you need to do is just include the header. There's a little bit more to it. You do need another file that says hash define catch config main before the header, and that will include all the implementation, depending on which version you're using. So I'm going to sidestep that for the moment, assume that's all done. Stick this header in a file. Actually, that's all we need to get started. We can run that. And it will tell us, quite helpfully, that no tests ran. Might seem a bit pointless, but actually, this is still valuable. We know we've got our infrastructure up and running. We know what our starting point is. It's meeting expectations. OK, well, we can add a test case. That's what they look like in catch. No, nothing in there at the moment, but we get some different feedback. Now it's telling us one test case ran, it passed or at least it didn't fail, subtle distinction. There were no assertions. Now, sometimes having an empty test case is actually can be a problem, maybe not, not expected. So it might be 
you sort of have a better warning about that. So if you run catch with W no assertions, it will actually make that fail. No assertions in test case. Now we've got some red. This is a failure that we expected. We can actually use this to, to start our TDD cycle. We can just put the simplest thing in there that's going to make that pass. We're now back at green. It's the little things. This might seem pointless, and to be fair, this one I don't usually do in practice. <laughs> but it's a useful, useful experiment just to see how far you can take this. Because notice these don't actually take that long, seconds, to go through these. So you're not actually wasting that much time. But the rewards do come. Let's carry on. Let's actually write a real assertion now. So we're doing TDD, so we're going to write the code before, sorry, write the test before we write the code to make it pass. So we're calling a function called left pad. We're going to give it a string, a, a padded length, and then compare that against the result. Now remember the rule, we start with the simplest values. So we've got an empty string, zero padded length. But of course it doesn't compile because we haven't written left pad yet. So that's our next failure. Compiler's not working. We don't even need to compile it. If you're using a modern IDE, when I tend to use CLine, it will highlight that missing function in red for me. That's enough for me. That's my, my red, my failing test. Now I just need to write the simplest code to make that pass. So here's a left pad function. It takes a string view, a size, returns a, a string. So I'm returning the empty string because that rule about using the simplest possible values applies on the implementation side as well. But now there's a problem, because now this is effectively a new test. We've got, we're going to get the compile test to work. This is the first time with the runtime test, and it passes. But we need to start with a failing test. It just so happens that in this case, empty string was what we expected. So to do this by the book, we need to be a little bit creative. We're going to need to change either the test or the code under test so that this fails, just so that we can change it back and see it work. Which one do you change? You could do either, but I, I prefer to think that the test is actually correct as it is, whereas the code under test is still under iterative development, so I'm going to change that. So let's return x. And now we see the failure. We're starting to get some richer feedback here. We can see the values involved. We can see the x there. We know this is all working. That's good. This is useful feedback. And now we know that if we change that back, we know that it's that change that made this pass. How often have you been chasing something down for hours, days, maybe longer? Because what you thought you were testing wasn't. Doing this by the book really helps you to prevent that a lot of the time. So often, well, I expected that to, to pass, but actually it didn't. Or I expected it to fail. Um, but it didn't. So it is useful. Not as pointless as it seems. All right, let's, let's um, take it up a notch. I'll add another test. This time with a, uh, a string. So I'm only going to introduce a string and not a pad length. And I'm going to keep that string as short as possible because we want to increment that complexity as tightly as possible. Of course, that fails because we're still returning a hard-coded empty string. We've got our failure. Simplest thing to make that pass will be to return the string we pass in. We have to convert it. Now it passes. But we haven't looked at the pad length yet. So now let's write a test with a non-zero pad length, but I'm now going to keep the string zero, keeping things as simple as possible. So with a pad length of one, we expect just a single white space character. Of course, that fails. So now we need an if statement. You can see how we're getting progressively, it's not just more code, but it's more complexity of code. We've moved from hard-coded constant to a variable to a conditional, and that's the progression we'd like to see. If, if you don't do that, you actually start to run into problems where you have to implement a load of things at once. So that, that's the reason we, we try to do that. So if at the, the minimum padded length is less than the string length, we can do what we were doing before, just return the input string. Otherwise, right now we're on a new branch. 
So we've got to go back to the simplest possible thing, the hard-coded string. Passes the test. Forces us to write another test so that we can, we can generalize. So pad length of two. We now need two spaces. Of course, that's failing, so. There is a constructor for stood string that takes a character and a number of repetitions for that character that we want to use here. And if you're like me, this is how you would write it, which unfortunately is wrong. So that fails, because actually the arguments are the other way around, but it still compiles. The test caught it, so that's great, because that could have taken a lot longer to, to find if it was buried deep in something. All right, so now we've got the number of repetitions correctly. Next test to write, we're going to combine a, a non-empty string and a non-zero pad length <laughs> that's greater than the length of the string. That fails because our else clause, we're only returning white space still. What we actually need to do is add the input string and reduce the pad length by the size of that string. And now it passes. And now we're getting much more general. In fact, I struggle to think of more tests that I can write at this point that are going to fail. Which means, as far as TDD is concerned, I'm basically done. Except what step have we missed? The refactoring step. We haven't really looked at that yet. Uh, and it's OK to go a few iterations before you consider the refactoring step, as long as you do that deliberately. Uh, it's if you forget to do it at all, you run into problems. So what can we refactor here? Well, first of all, the test case is also subject to refactoring. And if you've done much testing before, especially with CDD, you've probably heard of the single assert rule, where you only have one assert uh, per test case. I like to call it the single logical assert rule. It can be multiple assertions, as long as they're all asserting basically the same state or the same property. So in this case, I'd probably group these into a few, a few different sections in catch or test cases within a fixture in another framework. Um, I'm not going to do that here because I don't have enough screen space, so I'll leave it for the moment as an exercise. I want to concentrate on the, the code. What can we refactor there? There's a few directions you could take it in. Um, I want to start with the, uh, the, in the else clause, the first string, the, um, the length, min then minus str dot length. Uh, it's not so obvious what that means, so I'm going to pull that out, do an extract variable refactoring. That's the pad length. So the pad length is min then minus the length of the string. OK, so pure refactoring. It hasn't changed behavior. It's only the structure of the code. So all the tests are still green. This is how it works. Now, having done that, it's clearer to me that I can see, well, we've got two conversions of our string view to a string we're returning. It'd be nice if we could combine that somehow. The only difference is that we're adding that pad string. Um, if pad len was zero, that would be a zero string. So it would be the same as the first case. I wonder if there's a way that we can, we can combine those into one. Well, here's my first attempt. You stood max to, to say, well, if it's more than zero, we'll use the difference between the, the sizes. Otherwise, we'll just use zero. And then we can use that with the stood string. Uh, the, the padded string, zero string, and our input string, and unfortunately it doesn't work. In fact, we get an exception. And if you haven't spotted yet what the problem is, I think half of the room have and half haven't probably, <laughs> then you might need to debug this. And it's interesting, when you do TDD, you actually debug a lot less. But you still have to debug sometimes. In cases like this, it wasn't expected. But it really helps you because now you've got the exact file in line number of the test that failed. You can put a breakpoint there and start stepping in, and you'll soon see what the problem is. And in this case, it's because our, our two lengths that we're subtracting, they're both unsigned. So if, if you subtract a larger unsigned number from a smaller one, you're going to get a really big number and then try to allocate a string that size. <laughs> so that's what's blowing up. So a way to fix that 
is to use stubmax of int. Uh, that's all you need to do, but um, I'm changing the signature as well to be uh, min length as an int. I think that's just a more honest interface, so I'll make that change as well. And that is enough to make it back to green. So we've been able to reduce our implementation down to two lines. If you like, you could take it further and just inline that, and make it all one line. Depends on your, your style. Or you could consider that maybe this is not the, the best performance. You're, you've got this redundant string in there. Um, you've got string conversions going on. Maybe you want to take it by, by std string in the first place and um, return it as an R value reference. Lots of things you could do. We're not going to go any further now. Point is, all your tests are covering you. They're now acting as regression tests. So it gives us a lot of freedom, a lot of liberation from worrying about, oh, I can make this test, but it's a bit risky. I might break something. doesn't matter. You can just revert back to your previous state any time, and you're never more than a few seconds away from green, is the principle. So that's been a really quick example of how TDD works. Lots of questions unanswered, I know, but it's not the main focus of this particular talk, but I just wanted to give you a feel for how it works and some of these things we're going to refer back to. So we looked at the TDD cycle, red-green refactor, we've seen how that works in practice. We even saw that are you done step. We didn't actually get that many tests at the end. Um, in fact, I, I just skip over one point when we realized we're, we're done with the TDD tests. It doesn't mean that there's not other tests that we, couldn't, we could write. And I probably would probe around at the, um, the boundaries a little bit more, either side of things where behavior changes. But beyond that, you're just sort of poking at random numbers. And there's better ways to do that. I would normally reach for property-based testing, or in catch, you can use generators to approximate the same thing. Other frameworks may have something similar. Anything where you're, instead of looking at specific examples, that you need to know up front, you need to thought of, you get the framework to generate the values, and then you just say what properties should always hold. And it's a bit of a shift in thinking, so I'm not going to go into too much detail now. I've done other talks on it. Look up property-based testing if you haven't looked at it before. Um, and in fact, I've uh, done another talk with that example where I talk about property-based testing. So I think there's a link at the end to that one. But it means that your TDE tests are actually maybe less than you might expect because you've got that are you done step in there. So that was our um, first cycle. The second cycle, now we're going to change gears and get into the psychology. So this is the habit forming cycle or the habit loop. You may have seen something like this before, uh, and that's fine. It can be revision, but we're also then going to look at how this applies in the context of TDD, and that might be new. So how does this work? Well, the reason this is so important in the first place, just taking a step back, forget TDD for a minute, this is actually a, a genuine life hack, <laughs> if you've never looked at this before. Because it turns out, because of that, that association mechanism we talked about, these pathways through the brain that become habits get so well entrenched so quickly that to a first approximation, it's almost impossible to break them. And you probably can think of many experiences that bear that out. Things that should be easy to change, but they're not. So the way you change habits is not by breaking them, but by replacing them. You need to build a new habit that is stronger. And the key to that is identifying these components. Because what we usually think of as a habit is actually just the behavior. That's the thing that you do. You also need to identify the cue or the trigger, which is the event or context or environment that starts off the, the process in your brain. Something that triggers what we sometimes call a routine, here I'm calling a behavior. And it does that because at some point in the past, you've been seeking a reward, consciously or subconsciously. It doesn't matter. Because as animals, and now we get more to the neuroscience, we are um, driven by the, the pleasure-pain principle. You've probably heard of that as well. So we're, we're driven away from pain and towards pleasure, naturally at a sort of an instinctive 
level. Even if cognitively we're trying to go the different direction, <laughs> it, it gets tricky. So because of that, there's some reward that we're trying to move towards. And if we've done that in a context enough times, it doesn't take many times, then whatever behavior got, got us there, now that becomes the link. The cue or the trigger is linked to the behavior because it wants to get to the reward. And once you've established that link, you don't need the reward anymore. So you might find it's not even present. That makes it really hard to track down what the reward was. Because if you can find out what it was, you stand a much better chance of replacing it with something new. Either the same reward, the equivalent, or a bigger reward, even better. Because you want to set up a new, a new trigger for the queue to get you to this new reward. That's how we do it. Now, the trouble is, because the, the pleasure pain principle is a much lower level, subconscious level almost, it doesn't respond to long-term goals. So, in our case, with TDD, thinking about the long-term benefits, so the nice, well-factored code base, low defect rates, <coughs> um, able to easily change it, or, or whatever benefits you want to bring to it, they're all long-term. That's not going to motivate you here. That's not going to form a new habit. And this is one of the, the biggest problems, just in general, with, with habit building, is we, we think about long-term benefits, but they don't motivate, they don't drive the habit loop. So what rewards can we get? Well, here's my first stab at a TDD habit loop. So when you want to write some code, the behavior we want is that if I write it with a test first, ideally, but at all, will be good. Then the reward I'm looking for is that I get immediate positive feedback. Might seem like a little thing. That's OK. Doesn't necessarily take much. It just needs to be something that gives you a response, a positive response. And because of the way we do TDD, we're going around these cycles, often in seconds, which means we could do hundreds, thousands of these in a single session we are repeating this loop over and over again. So a little thing can add up. In a moment, we're going to see if we can take it to the next level as well. But this is a good start. So when we looked at the, the TDD example a moment ago, we saw that uh, every time we, we made a change, the, the tests were red, and then we changed the code, and they went green. And it's like this, this positive, positive feedback. I mean, yes, everything's, everything's working correctly. All right, let's, let's see if we can take this further. Oh, before we do that, I should also say, we mentioned a moment ago, we don't actually need the reward after a while. And the consequence of that is, it's, once you've established a habit, it's hard not to follow it. Which means, for us, if we can establish this TDD habit, it will become hard to write code without doing it with TDD. Which may or may not be what you want. <laughs> Bear that in mind. So let's, let's take it to the next level with dopamine triggers. So we're all familiar with dopamine, I'm sure. Wikipedia has this to say. Uh, in popular culture and media, dopamine is often portrayed as the main chemical of pleasure. We talked a moment ago about the pain-pleasure principle, so we can see how this fits in. You know, we, we want to move towards the pleasure, so we can see how dopamine fits in. But there's something a bit off here. Look at that phrasing. In popular culture and media, dopamine is often portrayed as. Does that mean that it's not the main chemical of pleasure? There's a bit of nuance. If we carry on reading, it says, but the current opinion in pharmacology is that dopamine instead confers motivational salience. Now, what does that mean? This is actually really interesting. So the motivational part, which well, should be easy to understand, <coughs> but one thing to note is Motivation has the same root as the word motion. <coughs> Excuse me. So it's all part of that moving towards something, either physically or metaphorically, moving towards pleasure in this case. So we're going to understand that bit. What does salience mean? Well, if you don't, if that word's not familiar, you're probably familiar with the word salient, like the salient facts. They're the important or relevant facts. So what, do, what does it mean when you put this together? Well, it turns out what this means is that you are motivated 
to establish the important facts or the important things going on in your environment. <coughs> Excuse me. Now, you've probably heard of the experiment uh, with the mon well-trained monkeys who pull a lever to get a treat. And if they get the treat every time they pull the lever, they're really excited to start with. They just lose interest a bit after a while. They know, well, if I want the treat, I'll pull the lever. Right, they've, they've established the pattern. They understand it. They know it. Yeah, so what? They don't really get any further motivation. And they don't show uh, signs of high levels of dopamine. But if you only give the treat 50% of the time at random, they stay motivated. And dopamine levels are really high. Put it in this context, what they're doing is they're still trying to find the pattern. The dopamine is raising their awareness so they can be on the lookout for the salient facts that are going to help them to establish the pattern so they can keep getting that reward. What this means is, any case where you may get the reward, some or most of the time, but not all of the time, you get high levels of dopamine, which increase your ability to learn. They prime you for learning. So how does this all fit in? <clears throat> well, let's look at some, some things that I've identified as, uh, as dopamine triggers in TDD. So we talked about seeing a test pass. I'd actually go further and say that seeing a test go from red to green is even better because you've seen that it fails and now it's passing precisely because of what you just did. There's a stronger connection there. And if you do see something in green, this is why I recommend using some sort of test framework or test runner that will show you things in green. It's an even stronger association. Then there's uh, the, the race to green. The, um, the green step where you're actually free to just sort of hack at code and, and get things to work and not worry about clean code. So it's actually quite liberating and fun. Or you may be more, more motivated to clean up code, in which case the refactor step can be really fun. In fact, they can both be fun. And they can both trigger dopamine because all of these things may not always work as you expected. So you're constantly thinking, does this work? Ah, yes, it does. Does this work? Oh, it didn't this time. Why? And now you're primed for learning, for analyzing and working out what it was that went wrong because of the dopamine. So it plays two roles. One, to help you stay motivated and establish that habit, but also to be able to be more aware of the code and learn from your mistakes than you would have been otherwise. I think this is one of the key things. Now, I think we're running a little bit <coughs> short, so I'm going to rush ahead a little bit. And talk about the third main area, externalizing your brain. So, it's a slight change of topic. And if we go back to sort of evolutionarily speaking, our brains are what we call open loop mechanisms, which means they work best with other brains, not just in isolation. We can survive in isolation to a point, but we, we start to deteriorate and we thrive with other people. And some people's personality may be more strongly correlated with that than others, but the principle is there just in the way we, uh, we operate as humans, this open loop principle. So, you know, many minds can be greater than, again, the sum of their parts. But it doesn't just work with other people. We discovered long ago that we can actually use other ways of noting down what we're thinking so that we can free ourselves up to think about other things, knowing that we're not going to lose sight of the big picture. We can come back to it. And then we developed more advanced ways of doing that, like mind mapping. The whole word mind map comes from mapping your mind onto paper for exactly this purpose, to free our mind up from other irrelevant details from what you're focusing on so you can focus on it. And of course, in the digital age, we can use computers for the same sort of thing, whether that's just for note taking or mind mapping, but also, it turns out, TDD fits right in here as well. Here's why. So we talked about the three main components of TDD, the red, green, and refactor stages. Now, each of those stages, you play a different role. 
and you have a different mindset for each of those roles. So the first stage, the red stage, you're thinking more about user experience, not necessarily from a UI perspective, but more from the user of your code, the caller of your function, whoever's using your class. Thinking of it from the other side, rather than the implementation details. You're also thinking about high-level design, how that fits in, and what the actual requirements are. To the point that you may be thinking, is this something we actually need? Or do I need to get clarification on this from some business expert or whatever it is? You're not worried about the implementation details, you're just thinking at that level. And you know, we play these roles, all of these roles at different times. Moving between them seamlessly can be hard. But when you pass to the green stage, you automatically flip into this sort of race to green hacker sort of uh, mindset where you're thinking about implementation. And we've encoded the requirements in the test. We don't have to worry about that anymore, which means we are liberated from having to take on that role. And that's what helps us to move in. We get both the trigger to move, the switch of task, and the ability to let go of thinking about requirements, because it's encoded in the test. We can completely immerse ourselves in implementation. And similarly, moving to the refactor step, now we're thinking about low-level design, clean code principles, well-factored code, not having to worry about raw implementation, because we were, we were all green, not having to think about requirements, the tests are covering all of those as well. So it's another subtle shift. And this is why I put the are we done step in here as well, because when we go to the are we done step, we're actually going back over to that requirements mindset mind, uh, portion. And we have a place where we can cleanly cut across back to requirements thinking, and it's there we make the decision what's next. Because often we can make the decision what's next while we're in that implementer's frame of mind and we end up gold plating a solution that wasn't really necessary. This helps to prevent that. This mindset shifting doesn't come straight away. It takes a little bit of practice with the TDD cycle. You need to be competent at that before you start to notice this shift in mindset and shift in role and shift in what mental resources you bring to those given problems. Because they are different. And it really, really helps you to quickly move between them. Remember, we can go around the whole loop in seconds. We like playing three different roles in that time. So that's how, oh, and the, the other part to this is, as we mentioned with the um, writing a failing test, encoding the test, you can think of that like a mental save point. Right, I've done all my thinking at this level externalize it to the code, now I can move on to the next one. That's how we externalize our brain. So, that's the three areas that we looked at. Habit forming, and how to build a new good habit for, for TDD. Leaning into dopamine triggers to help with the habits, but also for their own benefit, and to help you have fun with the code. And externalizing your brain so that you can actually focus on the different parts as you need them. So let's now see how we're doing with this list. So I think the bottom two, I think are fairly obvious that, well, if you follow everything I've been talking about, code, uh, writing tests first should be fun, especially if you lean into your dopamine triggers and you, you do the, the, the race to green and the refactoring freed up from the other responsibilities. That really brings out the fun in coding. Keeping you focused on what matters. It's what we were just talking about. By focusing just on what we're doing at any particular time and locking in everything else into the code. So we don't have that point like that cartoon with the, the person debugging something in his head. <laughs> He's got all the parts there and someone comes along, random comment and it's all gone. No, it's all in the code. In a form that you can readily get back to. I'll often leave a failing test on a Friday night so when I come back in in the morning, I think, oh, I've just got to make that test pass. Gets you back into the right mindset. So we can tick those off if you buy into everything I said, which is not a given. What about the other two? It's still more work. You've still got to, to write you know, as much test code as the production code. That's got to slow you down, hasn't it? Especially doing all those iterations where you're writing code, you know you're going to change. It's got to be a waste of time. 
Well, you've probably heard of left shifting. I trace the term back to this uh, 2001 article in Dr. Dobbs' journal, Shift Left Testing. But the idea behind it goes back much further. And I think my first encounter with it would have been in this book, Code Complete. Who's read Code Complete? So it used to be, if you ask that question in the 90s, uh, about half the room would have put their hands up. It used to be the go-to book. There was a second edition in 2004. So it has been updated, but um, yeah, it's not quite as relevant as it used to be. But a lot of it is still really relevant. And this is the first time I saw a graph like this. So this is from the, uh, the first edition. It's been slightly updated. Um, <clears throat> the idea is you've got the different points of the software development lifecycle, from analysis or requirements gathering through architecture and design implementation. There's always a test stage at the end, even if you are doing testing earlier and finally maintenance. And the idea is that the more on the right-hand side of the graph you go, the more expensive it is to fix a defect. Not just expensive in, uh, in financial cost, which is really what this graph was talking about, but also in time in general. Which means the earlier you fix a defect, the less it's going to cost you in time and money. So moving things back to developer testing as much as possible, which is really what this was talking about, will save a lot. Moving it to before you write the code is even, uh, saves you even more because you don't put the bugs in in the first place. But some of those issues are actually going to be in the design. So of course, pushing it even further to the left into the design and analysis stages is clearly even more valuable. And TDD even helps with that in a number of ways. One, when you're in that analysis mindset, you're much more likely to question requirements rather than just blindly implementing them because you're freed up to, to think about them. You may go off and have a conversation with a business expert. Another is that the principles of TDD don't just apply at that level. And in fact, BDD, behavior-driven development, is much more about having those conversations up front with domain experts before you start writing any code, while you're still establishing the requirements, putting it into a structure very similar to what we're talking about with TDD, but earlier. So all of these things all combine to save you time by avoiding lots of rework. Before we take that last one off, I want to ask one more question, which is, why do cars have brakes? I usually ask this when I'm doing TDD training, and then I get responses from the audience. And of course, they know it's a bit of a trick question, so they're trying to see what the trick is. But the, the obvious answer would be, so you can stop or slow down. Of course, the answer I'm looking for is so you can go faster. Because how fast would you drive your car if it didn't have any brakes? But it's the same with tests. Well, tests will stop your code, your, your test code at least running, if, if, they, um, if they fail, if they didn't do that, then you wouldn't be able to go as fast when you're writing code because you wouldn't take the same risks. They give you the confidence to make big changes knowing that the test will, will catch you if, they, uh, if you break anything. So you can actually go faster by having tests, which I think ticks off all of the boxes. We avoid rework by catching issues earlier or preventing them in the first place. Speed you up by giving you the confidence to make um, design level changes. Keep you focused on what matters, as we said, because we can externalize our brain and we can have fun doing it all. So that brings us to the end. There's the, the link that I was telling you about, levelofindirection.com slash refs slash rewire.html. So I'll leave that up there if you want to uh, take a photo for, for more reading. But that is the end of the talk. So thank you very much. And I think we even have time for some questions if there are any.
Yeah, uh, I noticed you used the require macro in your in your test example. Yeah. Wouldn't it uh, be better to use the check macro so you don't fail the entire test case? You want the test to continue running, right? So the, I used the require macro when I was doing the uh, the, the catch tests, and in, in catch you can do require will abort uh, immediately if it fails, whereas check it does the same thing, but it will carry on. So it will report the failure, but also run subsequent uh, assertions. Um, I go backwards and forwards on which one my default should be. If you follow the single assert rule, then all of your assertions should be on the, basically the same logical state. And that sort of favors doing checks, because then you want to find all the different dimensions that could have failed in. Um, but sometimes you, you know, one test sort of has to follow on from another. And you want to say, well, if this thing was null, um, you know, then, then don't carry on and do this other thing. There's other ways to do that as well. So, I do maybe lean more towards check these days than require, but it's a, it's a philosophical question I haven't quite <laughs> got to the bottom of yet. Thank you. Thanks. All right, so we have an online question. Um, even while TD or also BDD is trending, I feel sometimes the most difficult part to migrate to search is to get buy-in from both the team and the business as people fear change. Do you have any ph philosophical or psychological advice to deal with this? I think, to keep with the theme here, uh, my best advice there would be to um, affect other people with the idea that this is going to actually be fun. Maybe sort of set up sessions outside of your normal project where you like, play games or do exercises to, to establish that part. And then when people buy into the fact that this is actually fun and productive, well then of course, why wouldn't you, you try that elsewhere? But it's uh, still an open question that, um, Every situation is different, and it's not easy. But I think if you get to the point that you're experiencing these things yourself, it's much easier to then convey that to somebody else. Yeah, yeah. I was um, just wondering, now you were talking about yeah, test-driven development, and you're writing codes from scratch and adding tests for that while you're developing. But oftentimes at work, I, I find myself trying to add functionality to existing code. Mm -hmm. But there are no tests, so I want to start writing unit tests for, for code that has been there for a long time. But often, yeah, I find it hard to write requir requirements for code for which there are no clear requirements. Um, so how do you, do you have any tips and tricks on how to start there? So we have, we have three minutes left. And <laughs> when I do my two-day TDD training, I devote um, about one th two-thirds of one day for that <laughs> question. Um, yeah, the short answer is it, it's hard. <laughs> the, the slightly longer answer is there are techniques that can help, um, but that's where it becomes out of scope for right now. But uh, at the very least, look into approval tests if you've not done already. They're a really great way to lock in what the current behavior is uh, without having lots of unit tests so that you can iterate towards a place where more of the code is, is properly tested. But uh, see some of my other talks for more. All right, thanks. Welcome. Um, I have a question going back to your example. Um, when you said one thing which I found interesting, and maybe I misunderstood you, but you said you um, write one test, then implement the functionality, then write run test, and you don't write multiple tests and implement the functionality. And I, um, yes. Yeah, okay, I, I didn't misunderstand you there, because I don't understand why would you you do this um, and the thinking is basically what you said you want to free up your mental capacity and when you implement a function you already know multiple things you you want to do you know edge cases and stuff why not write all those as uh, tests and then implement them all at once or multiple at once mm -hmm. not all necessary so um there's nothing wrong with thinking ahead and thinking well i need all these things tested and maybe you want to write those all out at once. One of the problems with that is that your design may subtly shift as you're going. So TDD doesn't prevent upfront design, but you have to be more agile about it, and it may not end up exactly where you, you thought it would. Uh, and that means you may have just spent a load of time writing these tests, and you have to rewrite them all. That, that, that may be fine. Um, I, at the very least, I would probably comment out all of the tests except the one I'm currently working on, because you want to just, just see the failure for the current test, for the current thing you're working on, and then uncomment the next one, uncomment the next one. 
Uh, so you might want to do that. But in general, you're writing these tests to tease out the design that you already had in mind to make sure that every aspect of it is locked in with the test. So you have this dance between the, the test code and the production code, sort of, you know, each thing sort of forcing the other's hand to inch towards that design. Uh, and it's, it's a little bit harder to plan that out, uh, but there might be certain sort of milestones along the way that you do want to make sure you don't forget. So that, that would be fine. Okay, Does that thanks. answer your question? Yeah, yeah, kind of. Thank you. Thanks. Um, just a quick one. So, what if we break the test itself? So, you know, so should the break, should the the, uh, the test should, um, be kind of um, a golden, the golden rule that we start from writing the test, so that we do not break the test themselves? Uh, if we do some kind of refactoring, let's say we change um, the 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 whole architecture, you know, the design we put in in, in the um, in the implementation, that would of course, affect the tests themselves. So, that's, um, is that? So, if I understand the question correctly, you're saying is that it, what, what happens if you break, um, break a test, not because the code's at fault, but because the design has changed or it wasn't quite what you thought? Mm -hmm. is, that, yeah, yeah. is that fair? Yeah. Because well, what we've been doing, we've been going progressively, right? So, we, we, do, we start from the test, and then based on that, we go with the implementation. Right. All right. So uh, th there's usually two reasons that that would happen. One is that the, the requirements have actually changed. If the requirements have changed, or your design for the requirements have changed, then you have to deal with that. You know, the, the tests are now testing the wrong requirements. But more commonly, it happens because you've been testing implementation details rather than the public interface that maps to the design. And, and there's, there's reasons you might legitimately do that. Uh, particularly if you're using TDD, you tend to sort of build things from the bottom up uh, before you actually meet the high level requirements. And they can change without the high level requirements changing. You just have to be aware that that's what you're doing and be prepared to potentially throw tests away or rewrite them if that's the case. But try to avoid times when you are relying on implementation level tests uh, solely because they become very brittle and you're much more likely to, to break them without actually changing the, the top level behavior. So progression here is, is really the key, progression. So we cannot by any means have two independent teams, for example, working on you know, the testing side and, and the implementation. It has to be always um, going step by step like that. So maybe that's another question. Would it be possible to have independent teams working on both sides with the TDD concept? I think that's getting into a, a bigger topic than we probably have time for now, so maybe we'll pick this up uh, afterwards. But uh, thanks for the question, and thanks, everyone, for listening.